Hey everyone, God bless you. Evangelist Joel here with you guys. Um, just have something that God's placed on my heart that I'd like to share with you guys once again. And it's going to be really eye-opening and I'm excited for what God's shown me because it's going to change the way that you view God and how you see him. And the reason why he showed this to me was so I could teach you guys what it is. And the title of this is going to be as simple as God wants you to be successful. And I'm going to show you in the scripture where it talks, where, where I learned how much God wants you to be successful through his word, because before you become successful, the world had to have an opportunity to be able to become successful, which was only going to be done through his son, Jesus. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created man, and man dwelt among in the earth. But as man was in the earth, we know that man fell short and that he sinned against God. And that sin is what brought him out of the Garden of Eden and brought him into the wilderness, which the wilderness represented lack and, you know, frustration and, you know, not having plentiful or anything along those lines. But Jesus came as the second Adam. And the second Adam is the one that was going to be the only one that was going to bring us back, be able to bring us back, mind you, to the Garden of Eden and out of the wilderness back into the Garden of Eden. So it was going to be the opposite. So what man did, he messed up and he sinned against God. And therefore, God had to remove him out of the Garden of Eden and into the wilderness. So God saw that what happened was not good for man because he knew that it was going to be mean and lack for the rest of man's life. So God had a plan and said, you know what, I'm going to send my son Jesus, who is the second Adam, into the world to do the opposite and bring them from the wilderness back into the garden. And I want to show you what God does in order to make it, to fulfill that Jesus was going to be that answer for all of mankind. Now, if you just go ahead and I'm going to say, I'm going to let you know that God wants you to be successful. And I wrote these notes down because it's important. And it, and it says, I wrote, how do I, how do I know this? How do I know that God really wants you to succeed in, in life, in what you want to do, right? Well, first we know that no one on earth ever prayed or told God to God for him to send his only son so we could be saved from our sins. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the people cried out to God so he could send his only son. And the reason why I say this is because God was the only one who knew that his son even existed. Okay? So God was the only one who knew he had a son in the first place. No one on earth knew that Jesus existed. No one, no one on earth knew that this, um, the Son of God existed in the heavens already, okay? Um, no one knew the name of Jesus until the prophet Isaiah was told by God that he was going to send his son. And I want to, to go into Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 through 15 with me. And it says here that, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. So notice God himself is going to give us as mankind a sign that he's going to do something for us. Not that we were going to do something for God so that he could do something for us, but that he himself was going to do this sign. No one prayed or cried out, like I said, for him to send his son, Jesus. The sign that this is talking about is Jesus himself. The sign that the word of God is saying, where the, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The sign is Jesus Christ. So notice no one else but God himself is going to show mankind that Jesus is his son. Watch. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive, and this is the sign. 
Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And he says, curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Look, in the beginning when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they did not know the difference between what was good and what was evil. What happened was that they ate from the fruit that gave them knowledge of good and evil. Remember? Because in the Bible, it talks about that Adam and Eve, when they were first in the garden, they were completely naked. And I say that to bring glory to God because when they were completely naked, they had no idea that they were naked. So since they didn't even know they were naked, they didn't know good or evil. So they were just present in the presence of God. That's how they lived. They lived every day just in the presence of God because in the Garden of Eden, that represented his presence and where he was and he walked with them. But as soon as Eve and Adam took a bite from the apple where he, or, you know, from the fruit, right? I don't know if they were saying apple, but from the fruit where God said not to eat from that tree, right? The moment that that happened, their eyes were opened to good and evil. And the moment that their eyes were opened to good and evil, they looked at each other and realized their eyes were opened and said, oh my gosh, you're naked and I'm naked. But before they ate from the fruit, from the tree, they didn't even know that they were naked in the first place because they didn't know good or evil. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? The knowledge of good and evil was what opened up sin into the world because of the disobedience and the deceit and the decep deception of the evil one. Okay. That was the first Adam. So we know that the first Adam failed. Okay. We know the first Adam was not successful in uh, not sinning against God. So when you sin against God, it drives you away from the presence of God. So therefore God had to remove Adam and Eve out of the garden and into the wilderness. And I say that because God loved them, but he had no choice because of their choices that they chose. And he had to remove them from the presence of himself and move them into the wilderness because sin, God does not tolerate and God does not, uh, you know, he doesn't like it. He hates sin. He hates evil. So that was the first Adam. We say that the first Adam failed because he fell short of the glory of God and he didn't make it, right? But now you have the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, okay? And I find it interesting that in the scriptures, it says that curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. So... Knowledge of good and evil entered into the world when Adam and Eve ate from the tree in the garden that they weren't supposed to. So God sent in his only son, who you and I never even knew about, but he himself is sending him to us as a sign, which is the sign is Jesus Christ, that he's going to do a new thing, okay? And what he's doing is he's saying that curds and honey – this son is going to eat so that he may know to choose what is good and refuse, which is evil. Because when you're born into the world, you're conceived in sin and you're born into sin. Because the world became cursed and sinful when Adam and Eve ate from the tree that they were not supposed to because they sinned against God. You understand? This is, this is a much bigger picture uh, an understanding of how much Jesus has set us free from and what he's delivered us from, okay? But I want to focus on Jesus here because God said in his word that this son, his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And curds and honey he will eat so that he may know to choose good, which who is good. 
God is the only one who is good. And refuse the evil. Who is evil? The devil. The enemy. The one that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the beginning. But he's literally saying, in before the child is even born, God is already saying that my son that I'm sending will choose good because I'm setting him up for success. Watch. The bio, like I said, in the beginning of this topic, it's called God wants you to be successful. And the reason why I know God wants us to be successful is because he sent his son. And because he sent his son, we can be successful. But watch. Without his son being successful first, you and I could have never been successful second. You understand? If God never made his son Jesus successful, our success was only going to come through Jesus' success. Because he was the only hope of mankind. Because sin entered into the world, and now there was no choice but to be separated from God. In his presence. But God loved us so much, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, like I said in the beginning, no one prayed for the son to come and to redeem the earth and redeem mankind from sin. No one did. God knew. God had the plan. God said, I know what's going to be and what's going to take care of this sin once and for all. And it's going to be my son that I'm sending that I myself will send. And that no one else knows that I have a son here. You get this? That no one else knows that I have a son. I'm the only one that has the knowledge that I have my only son. Do you understand this? This is how much God wants you to be successful. He sent his son, Jesus. If you don't believe that God wants you to succeed in things, then all you have to do is look no farther than the son. If you look at Jesus and see, you will see that God really loves you and has a plan, and he wants to see you succeed in everything that you do. Otherwise, he would have said, I'm the only one who knows this, but oh well, I'll just leave it as it is. And they'll be away from my presence for the rest of their lives. And they'll have no choice but have eternal life in hell. That would be not successful. That would be very unsuccessful, according to our understanding. If you had no choice to choose when you were born, because you can't choose when you're born or if you are going to be born, and God created you and all of a sudden you now have no choice but to know what pain and hurt and all these things are in life, and you would have to go to hell after you die, no matter what, without having a choice because sin separated you from God. So therefore, you can no longer have a relationship with God whatsoever because sin in the beginning that you didn't even do, but entered into the world because of Adam and Eve, because they sinned against God. Now you don't have a choice. You would say, that's not fair. That's not fair that I don't get a choice to whether if I was able to have the right to be able to go to heaven or go to hell. But God knew. God knew that the only way that you were going to have a choice and to open up that choice, because that door was closed. That door closed when sin entered into the world. But God knew the only thing that was going to reopen that door was going to be through his son, Jesus. Okay? And I really talk a lot about that because that's the gospel. And that's what Christians, as you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's where our hope is found. Our hope is found in Christ. Our hope is found in Jesus, which whom he, who the Father is, sent the Son so that we could have everlasting life. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Notice that God's already setting him up for success, Jesus, his son, because he's saying the virgin, okay, will conceive and have a son. Now, I, I talk about this because when you were born through your mother's womb, you were conceived in sin and you were born into sin. 
See? But God said, no, no, no. The, con the conceiving of my son is going to be through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is one that does not, is not sinful, is not born into sin and chooses what is good and not what is evil. So Jesus conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, not touched, meaning clean and pure, okay? Represented that Jesus Christ was going to be the Son of God, which was pure and holy to mankind. One thing, if Jesus ever made one mistake, if Jesus ever sinned one time, then that would have separated him from his father. Because they were not going to be able to, uh, you know, if, if you have sinned, then you would be separated from God. And if Jesus sinned, then therefore that second Adam would have failed just as the first Adam. But God was like, no, no, no. I'm going to make it to where it's impossible for my son to fall short of my glory. I'm going to make it where it's impossible for him to sin against me. It's, it's just amazing to me. Because we know that the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. And that the Son was the manifestation, the flesh that you and I got to see, which was the invisible image of who God is. And he sent basically himself through the Son. So that without fail, the plan that God had would be successful so that you and I could be successful. That's why I'm saying God wants you to be successful. He's designed you to be successful because he demonstrates that by sending his son, Jesus. It's just, it's amazing to me. I'm praying that you can get this in your spirit because when we look around, we go, is God really with us? Is God really for us? You know, all these different questions try to pop up and the devil tries to make you think is, you know, is God really the answer? You know, is Jesus really the son of God? Is, you know, is Jesus really the answer? Is he the one that really wants you, you know, to be successful in your ministry or in your career or whatever it is that you're doing in your life? Because right now, if you look around, it kind of doesn't look like that you're very successful. In fact, you know, that bill's coming up and he just goes on and on and on. And the devil tries to chirp in your ear and he tries to lie to you constantly. And he tries to say all these things that try to get your eyes off of God because he knows that it's the eternal truth. He knows that that's the eternal truth. So he tries everything possible to get you away from the truth. Because he knows that's the only thing that's going to set you free. And he doesn't want you to be free because he himself is not free. He himself is judged by God. Therefore, he wants to take as many people as possible with him to hell. So that, you know, he, he's trying to do what he can do for the rest of whatever he has time to do. Which is his goal. To get you away from God. Because he hates God. Okay. So. This is just the beginning of showing you. That God desires and wants his people. Set up for success. Watch now as God sets his son up for success. Because. I'm going to go back into the scripture of Isaiah. Chapter 7 um, verse 15. Curds and honey he shall eat. And he may know to refuse the evil. And choose the good. Now, watch this. There is one who is evil, and we know that that's the devil. And we know that there is only one who is good, and we know that that's God. Now, excuse me, Jesus himself even said that. If you look in Luke chapter 18, verse 19, it says, So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? See? No one is good but one, and that is God. See? So, we, we see that Jesus gets to see good when there's only one who is good, so therefore he could see his Father, who is God, instead of choosing evil, which is the father of lies, which is the devil. So, God, before his Son is born, speaks this over him. So Jesus knows to choose the good, which is his father, and refuse the evil, which is the devil. Before he's even born, 
God's word is already being proclaimed into Jesus' life. That he's not going to fail, but he's going to succeed. <laughs> Look at third, uh, third John chapter 1, verse 11. It says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. So before Jesus is even born, God's already declaring through the prophet Isaiah that curds and honey he's going to eat so that he may re know to refuse the evil and choose the good. So he's already saying, like 3 John ch chapter 1, verse 11 says, do not imitate what is evil. If you see what is evil, you're going to imitate it. But he says, but what is good? And who is good? We know that in Luke chapter 18, verse 19, we saw that only one is good, and that's God. He who does good is of God. So because Jesus does only, he only chooses the good, which is God, he who does good is of God. Therefore, since Jesus is going to choose what is good, He's going to do the things of God. And the person that does good is the person that's from God. Okay? But he who does evil has not seen God. So he allows him, Jesus, his son, to refuse evil and choose good before he's even born. God is already speaking this through the prophet and declaring it with his word, which his word does not return void. The Bible says, and then it does and it fulfills everything that God sends it to do. So as soon as he spoke those words, the world was already going to be set free from sin. The world was going to have another door that opened up for the world so that we could be in relationship with God again and be brought from the wilderness back into the Garden of Eden where God designed it in the beginning. See, God had a plan that man failed and messed it up. But everyone wants to blame God and say, well, you know, God knew that that was going to happen. And, you know, like, no, it was man's choice. Man's choice was to sin and to be deceived. There was a choice to either bite the fruit or not to eat from the fruit of the tree. You could eat from every other tree, God said. Every other tree, but don't eat from this one. And which one was the one that the devil tried to get them to eat from? Uh, only the one that God said not to eat from, because that's what he does. He tries to deceive you into the very thing that God said of the one thing not to do, and that is sin. It's, it's so simple, because... There were so many opportunities around them. They had all these other trees, all these other fruit trees that they could eat from. But God mentions the one, and the devil goes, oh, huh, I'm crafty in my way. So they have uh, thousands of trees to eat from. But what if I can take their focus off of those things that they had that's good and turn it on to those things, to the one thing that they don't have so they can desire it and they could try to, like, you know, they'll enter into sin, and then he'll take back what God gave to mankind by making mankind sin against God and separating them. Well, in that time, the devil succeeded. In that time, the enemy succeeded and made it to where now mankind is subject to the devil. Now mankind is subject to sin because he deceived man that God created in his image and he made them fall short and he made them sin so that they were taken from the garden of Eden into the wilderness. But now God says, I love the world so much that I'm going to send my only son Jesus to come and he's going to take him from the wilderness and bring them back into the garden. So he's going to reverse what the devil thought he won when Jesus is going to be the one that's going to win in the end, and he wins the victory because he's, he triumphs over death, it says. It says that he became sin who knew no sin, so you and I could become the righteousness of God. There's so much packed into the gospel.
that what Jesus paid for and gave to us and how God did it. And that's why I said God wants you to be successful because you and I, mankind, did not know that a son even existed. You and I did not know that this plan of perfection was going to be manifested in front of us and that all the sin of the world was going to be placed upon this son named Jesus. And you and I were going to be able to have relationship again with God. No one knew that. Only God knew that that's what was going to be the answer to all of mankind. And the Bible says that, and he will, and she will bear a son, and the sins of the world he will take away. He will take away the sins of the world. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is what covered those sins. Now, I'm going to go into uh, something a little bit more here. God wants you to be successful because Jesus was from God, so therefore he had to do good. And the Bible says in, like we read in 3 John chapter um, 1, verse 11, where it says that he who does good is of God. So Jesus was from God, so he had to do good. If Jesus did evil, he would have never seen his father. Think about it. Those who do evil... Or those who, you know, those who do evil are the ones that see it. But those who are from God are the ones that see God. So now Jesus would not be set up for success if God said something else. But instead, God said, my word will go and accomplish everything I sent it to do. Since God said Jesus will eat curds and honey so he knows to refuse evil and choose good, now the Bible teaches us that Jesus did nothing of himself, but he only did what he saw the Father doing. So, Jesus was good, so he had to see good. But he could only see good because God the Father sent it in his word and said, Curds and honey I will give to my son, he will eat, so he knows us to refuse evil and to do good. Okay? But Jesus says... When he's in the when he's a minister when he's ministering that he could do nothing of himself. The only things that he did he saw with his eyes what his father was doing. So if Jesus didn't know good, he couldn't see good, and therefore he would be able to do what the father was doing because only one is good, and that's the father. Okay. So God set him up for success. John 5 verse 19 says this, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. But if Jesus before he was born did not have this word spoken over him, which was the successful word that God was declaring over his Son, then Jesus would have never saw good. And if Jesus never saw good, he would never saw his father. And if he would never have saw his father, he could never have seen what he was doing. Therefore, he could never have done all those things that which he did. Because he says, I, I don't do anything of myself. I only saw what I saw my father doing. So what he was saying when he said, I only saw what my father was doing, he was saying, I only saw good. Because therefore, good was his father. Now watch. Isaiah 55, 11 says this. So shall my word, God's word, be that goes forth from my mouth. God spoke this. It shall not return to me void. Meaning it will, it will complete it. But it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So, Isaiah 55, 11 is the word of God, right? And we know the word of God is God, according to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, okay? So the word in this case that I'm reading in Isaiah 55, 11 is saying that the word that God is sending is his son, Jesus. So the sign that God is sending himself was his own word which was manifested 
through Jesus Christ. Stay with me, okay? I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. So it says that the word that God spoke, okay, was being manifested and fulfilled through his son, Jesus. But Jesus wasn't born yet, according to us. <laughs> but God spoke his word saying, he shall know good. Therefore, the word was what God spoke, and the word was also what was conceived in the Virgin Mary. So you have like double the word here. You have, I think it's double or triple the word coming here. Because... Now, Jesus, the Bible says that in John chapter 1, verse 14, says that in the word which God spoke in Isaiah, um, what is it, chapter 7, verse 14 through 15, because the word of God is God. So, therefore, when you're reading Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 through 15, that that's God's word being spoken, right? It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. L look at that. So God spoke through his word, Isaiah, and then he fulfilled the word by making the word become flesh, which was Jesus. And Jesus was the word himself that was already spoken by the Father before Jesus was even born. That's deep. That's deep stuff. That God designed it to be that successful so that you and I could be successful through his son, Jesus. God sent his word into the world, and his word was Jesus. Like I said, Jesus was not able to fail because of the word that was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, which was God. <laughs> This had doubled the power by God speaking it through the prophet Isaiah and Jesus himself being the very word which was spoken by Isaiah. <laughs> Jesus was both the fulfillment and the action of the word. Isn't that crazy? Jesus was both the fulfillment of the word and the action of the word which was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Lord, I'm, thank you, Jesus. You're so good. In the very beginning, I mentioned that it was spoken, the child will eat curds and honey, so he knows to refuse evil and choose the good. Well, if God says the child, his word says that the child will eat curds and honey, if God says that he's going to eat curds and honey, he's going to eat curds and honey. Because, like I said, if God says the child will eat curds and honey, then he will make a way for that to happen. Because he wants us to be successful, he wants his son to be successful. We are sons and daughters of God. And just like he wanted his son Jesus to be successful, he wants you and I to be successful because we are now found in his son who is successful. Now, God says in his word that there will come a time when the child is born and growing that he will cause thorns and briars to grow to create a barrier around the animals that would only be able to produce the curds and honey. Look at that. God is making it so possible that Jesus does choose what is good and refuses evil because he's going to eat curds and honey, that he creates the environment of briars and thorns and creates a barrier to where only where you can get curds and honey from the animals will be stationed and put at because God will create an environment of briars and thorns around it to make sure that no one can touch what his word is saying that it's going to fulfill. Oh my gosh, God is so good. He, he says his word, he backs up his word, and he protects his word, and he declares his word, and he fulfills his word. Okay? Hear me. Hear me in this. Because at this time, the kings are going to fight, and they're going to lose according to God. In the scriptures, it says that. I didn't read that part, but I'll get to it. But God tells them how curds and honey will be provided and protected. Why in the world are curds and honey so important to be protected? Because the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And if curds and honey is what's going to be, what's going to help Jesus 
choose what is good and refuse what is evil. That's the, that's the hope of all mankind lying and resting on Jesus's choice and his decision. But God goes, I'm going to make it so easy to make happen because the devil is going to try to come and bring a war. And the war is going to try to destroy the herd and destroy that where curds and honey comes from. Okay? Because he's trying to take out the plan of God. But God's like, my word will not return void. Therefore, I'm going to protect my word by doing this very thing. And I'm going to make an environment of briars and thorns around it where the sheep, where, you know, um, I'm sorry, where the curds and honey are going to be produced and they're not going to be cut off and they're not going to be stolen or burned or anything because my son Jesus, who's going to be born, that I spoke, my, my son that I said will be conceived through the virgin, will eat these curds and honey. So therefore, I'm going to provide these curds and honey. I'm going to protect these curds and honey because my word will not return void, but it will accomplish and do everything that I sent it to do. It's that simple. God is so um, focused on his word and what it's going to do. Watch. Isaiah chapter 7, verse uh, 21 through 22. Watch what it says this. It says, In that day, it shall be in that day that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. Why? Because curds and honey, they come from that animal, right? I'm not honey, I'm sorry, but curds will come from that. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he will eat curds. For curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. So think of, think of as a mother, you know, as a family, you, you have a child. And it's born, and it's at the time that it's born, and all of a sudden there's this war. And now there's this war, but you have to protect, you have to protect the son. You have to protect your daughter. You have to protect your son from the, the terrible things, which represents of the, the enemy's kingdom, which is the devil, which comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So Jesus is saying as soon as he's born that the kings are going to come, and they're going to wage war against each other, and they're going to start killing. They're going to start trying to kill off people and they're going to try to kill Jesus because this is the plan of God but God is saying I will create an environment a briar of thorns a barrier to protect that which I said will be done and it says that like he says for the curds and honey everyone will eat who is left in the land so he's already saying that's left in the land normally that means that there's a small amount but he's saying that his son Jesus is going to be a part of the rest of these people that are left. Because after the war, normally there's a lot of people that have died. Normally there's a lot of people that die in war through the sword and, you know, just because it's war. But God's going to preserve his word. God's going to protect his word. And God's going to go to make sure that his word is fulfilled. No matter how much the devil tries to take out his word, which is his son, Jesus, God is going to protect it because he wants him to be successful. Because if Jesus isn't successful, and if the devil was successful like he was with the first Adam by getting them out of the garden, then we would have no hope whatsoever. Our hope would be no more. But our hope is not found in Jesus because he did it. He accomplished everything that God sent him to do. So that you and I could be successful. But only if the son was successful could you and I become successful in Christ. That's why I said God wants you to be successful. And I'm sharing you this background because I'm, I'm showing you that God loved us so much that he made his son successful. Because he knew that if his son was not successful that you and I could not be successful. But we would be separated from God forever in eternity. But instead, he set, his son set up, he set his son up for success. Because through Jesus' success, we now have eternal life. Just like it says, for I love the world so much, right? That I'm sending my only begotten son that who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life was only going to be found through the son, Jesus. And God knew it. 
Mankind didn't know that. God's plan was so great. God's plan was so amazing. It was so simple, but yet so amazing. He didn't think, well, if that one fails, then I can use another one. Or if that one doesn't, then I can do that. He said, no, no, no. My word will not return void. And it will do, and it will accomplish everything that I sent it forth to do. He, he promises you things. He promises you these things through his son, Jesus. And if you can see the life of Jesus, then you can see how successful your life is supposed to be. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 24 through 25 says, Because all the land will become briars and thorns, and to any hill which could be dug with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. Meaning, no one's going to go there because of the briar and thorns. They won't be able to get access to it, but it's going to become a range. Meaning, uh, you know, like a, a massive landscape where oxen and sheep are going to be able to live in Rome to and throw the range because they're the ones going to go to provide the curds and the honey that th through the abundance of the milk like he said through the sheep that that's where the curds were going to come from isn't it interesting that god if jesus as fully man and fully god didn't have food to eat through curds and honey then he would have died of famine. He would have died of starvation. But God was like, no, I'm doing something and I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make my word come to pass. I'm going to make my word successful. And he set up his son Jesus for success. And that's all I have for now. But I, I just want to encourage you guys that God knows what you need. God knows what you've been praying for. But the word says that if he who is God did not withhold his son, his only begotten son, from the world, then how much more will he not give us all things? Because he's talking about that riches, silver, and gold, and prosperity, and money, and and, and uh uh, you know, um, abundance and everything like that is, is wonderful. It's great. But Jesus was the main focus. Because without Jesus, you and I had no choice to what eternal life was going to look like for us. We had no choice if we were ever going to be able to be allowed back into the presence of God. We had no choice to go back into the Garden of Eden because the devil won at that point. The devil had the victory at that point. But God said, no, you don't get the final say, Satan. You don't get the final say. My son, Jesus, gets the final say. And the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says that he overcame death, and death was the last thing that needed to be uh, defeated. Jesus did it. He paid the price for you and I. He paid the price and he fulfilled it. Because in the beginning, God declared and decreed it through his word. Like we said, Jesus was the word. Double portion, manifestation of his word. That it was going to be done and fulfilled that you and I could now believe in the Son. And have everlasting life. And we can now be in the presence of God for the rest of our lives. But before that, w there was no choice. Our choice was chosen by Adam and Eve. Our choice and our destiny, everything was chosen by Adam and Eve. It was based off of man and how they failed and how they sinned. But God said, I have one and only one that will not fail. And that will succeed. And that it will bring the people back to me. And I will no longer be separated from them. 
for the son's blood was going to be the atoning sacrifice for sin once and for all. And I'm so amazed by Jesus because that is what eternal life is, is knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified on what he paid and why he did it for you. Now, the Bible says that it's by grace that you've been saved. And I know that I said the blood of Jesus covers the sin. But now it's a choice for you and I. In the beginning, there was no choice for us to sin or not to sin. All we knew was sin. But interest, interestingly enough, the one who became sin knew no sin. So the very one who didn't know sin became all of sin. And the ones that we all knew sin and only sin alone became righteousness. So God exchanged everything of who he was so he could give it all to you so that we could exchange everything who we were the sinful nature and give it all to his son jesus and so that we could get the good we could be the ones benefiting from the cross we could be the ones benefiting from the goodness of god i love you guys so much and i really pray that this message has encouraged your spirit as it's encouraged mine. But I say this with warning. The Bible tells us that even though we've been born again and we're saved by grace, Paul says, do we continue in our sin? And he says, certainly not. Right? And a lot of people will say, well, I'm going to fall short of the glory of God. Because the Bible says that. I'm going to sin. But... The blood of Jesus did more than just save you and set you free from sin. It set you free from ever doing a sin ever again. It gave you grace to walk out the empowerment to overcome sin for the rest of your life, even here on earth, because Jesus paid the price. And I'll do probably another message on that later. But for right now, I love you guys so much. God bless you, and thank you so much for watching. Please, if you haven't, go ahead and subscribe. Go ahead and uh, comment if you have any comments and like this video and share it. Share it with many brothers and sisters in Christ so they can be encouraged through the simpleness of the word of God and how God set his son up for success so that you and I too could be set up for success for eternal life and while we're here on earth as well. Love you guys. Be led by the spirit and continue to grow in the spirit as your spirit man develops and as he continues to teach you and lead you into the things of truth, which will set you free here on earth forever and for eternity. God bless, guys.